Good afternoon. My name's Tim Dwyer. I'm visiting professor in building service systems at uh, UCL and also the technical editor of the SIBSI Journal. And I'd like to welcome all of you to today's webinar, Gen Sets, Are You Sitting Comfortably? The maintenance of a reliable electrical power supply for commercial and industrial spaces is indispensable for successful operation. Buildings are increasingly dependent on not just the availability of power to perform everyday activities, but many applications need a quality of uninterrupted supply that can be swiftly modulated, being ramped up and down to meet change in demand. This variability, together with increasing load densities, but particularly prevalent in data centers, present application challenges in what is a, a, a climate of regulatory and technological change. Today's webinar, pre presented by Kohler SDMO and supported by Kohler Uninterruptible Power, will consider modern application techniques, employing the appropriate technologies and highlight the questions that should be considered when approaching a potential supplier. We have two really good speakers today who've got a wealth of experience in the area. The first speaker will be Ian Wilkins, Wilkinson, uh, and uh, Ian is a data center channel manager uh, for Europe and Middle East and Africa for Kohler Power. He has over 20 years experience in the sale and application of capital equipment, and for the last 12 years has been dedicated to large electrical power sector. It includes national and global data centers, banking and healthcare. Originally qualified to HND in mechanical engineering, he has since developed a broad knowledge of critical electrical infrastructure to complement his mechanical background. Following Ian, we've got Alex Ems, who's the operations director for Kohler Uninterruptible Power. He has uh, 30 years experience of a power protection business and 19 years service with Kohler. He has a, a HNC qualification in electrical and electronic engineering and a wealth of practical experience. Through our presentation today, please use the ask a question button on the screen. You can type in your questions at any time and the speakers will respond to those questions at the end of the webinar as time permits. Any questions that aren't covered in today's webinar will be picked up later uh, by, by Kohler. A recording of the webinar will be available through the Sibsi Journal website in a few days' time, so you can go back and uh, refer to that. We'd ask before you leave us today, uh, we're going to have a short questionnaire on, on the screen, so please just hang on for a few seconds after we finish the webinar so that you can complete that feedback screen. You will receive confirmation of your participation in today's uh, webinar that be emailed out to you. So, without further ado, I'll pass across to Ian Wilkinson to start today's webinar. Over to you, Ian. Thanks, Tim. <clears throat> Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on gensets. Are you sizing comfortably, or are comfortable old norms holding you back? So let's look at the learning objectives and structure of today's session. First, I'll give you a brief overview of who we are, what factors are changing generator design, and what standards are applicable for generator installations, how to approach standby diesel generator sizing, the issues caused by applying historic norms to load acceptance criteria, and how they can be overcome by taking an integrated approach with the UPS, and finally, we'll talk about some considerations when choosing your power protection supplier. And then as Tim said, we'll take some questions at the end. Coal was first established in 1873 and is still a family owned business. Today, it employs 36,000 associates, over 50 production sites and in 17 countries. I work for Coal SDMO, which is part of the Coal Power Division but we also have five other business units. 
Cola UPS that join us today, Cola Sorrel who manufacture switchgear and control systems, Cola home and commercial generators, Cola industrial engines, manufacturing engines for construction equipment, and Clark Energy producing gas and gas CHP generators. We are the third largest generator OEM in the world. We manufacture generator sets from just a few kilowatts, which is the small unit on the left hand side, right up to the largest data center designed high speed generator set in the world, rated at 4000 kilowatts or 4500 kVA, which is produced in our factory in northern France, where we also package them in house into a range of enclosures from the simple drop overs, which is the blue unit in the center of your screen, to the larger ISO style containers, which are typically 12 meters long and would meet noise levels of around 80 to 85 dBA, right through to bespoke walk-in enclosures, which are capable of achieving very low noise levels within the smallest of footprints, therefore best suited to hyperscale data centers. So what's changing in the market and what are the needs? Well, power density of IT is certainly increasing, which puts pressure on the IT space and pushes the need for more powerful generators. Also, the faster the construction, the lower the build costs through compressed timescales. Manufacturing packaged generators off-site using modular repeatable designs, which can be easily scaled up into multi-megawatt installations, also reduces cost and operational complexity when the data center is live. And the generalism of skills means that clients tend to have fewer in-house specialist personnel, which drives a higher dependence on consultants and partner vendors to provide that specialist knowledge. Emissions legislation is of course driving a reduction in greenhouse gases. Many people will be aware of the EPA emissions, which is the Environmental Protection Agency in the US, but in the European Union, the medium plant combustion directive was introduced in 2018 aimed at limiting the emissions from generators above one megawatt thermal particularly those used in grid support and triad avoidance applications however it does provide an exclusion for emergency standby applications i.e those generators that are used to provide backup power if you have any specific questions about mpcd and how it applies to you then please get in touch after the event and we'll happily provide more information. Also, industry's own focus on sustainability, increasing efficiency and driving down PUE. Greenhouse gas reporting means that the power and energy usage from scope two can often be 100% offset through purchasing renewable energy. Therefore, direct usage scope one emissions from generators and other equipment comes more into focus. Okay, so let's look at the governor classification as set out in ISO 8528, which is the international standard that stipulates how a generator should perform when it's loaded. G3 is the most commonly used governor classification for data centers as it's a tougher specification than G2. So as you can see, the G3 criteria has a frequency acceptance of minus 70%, a frequency rejection of plus 10%, a voltage acceptance of minus 15%, a voltage rejection of plus 20%, and a recovery time to steady state within three seconds. This criteria sets the benchmark for generator performance and should allow engineers to compare one manufacturer to another. As well as setting out governor classification, it also details the load steps that should be used. So looking at the graph, as you can see, we've got five curves, the brown being the initial load step and the others being the subsequent steps. The BMEP or pressure within the engine cylinders determines the percentage and number of load steps for the generator to reach 100% load. The example here, uses a typical BMEP of 2,700 kPa from a modern fast response diesel engine. The brown line shows that the initial load step capability should be 30%. The second load step, which is the blue line, 
should be an additional 20%, so a 50% step in total, and so on until 100% load is achieved. Other performance criteria that's important in data center applications. Well, the ITIC publish a curve that defines the AC boundary, which most equipment can tolerate or ride through without experiencing unexpected shutdowns or malfunctions. Therefore, any power delivered to the IT stack needs to stay within these boundaries. ISO 8528 also sets out the different types of generator ratings from data center power, so only used in data centers, and the maximum power while supplying a variable load or a continuous load for an unlimited number of hours. However, prolonged operation with the utility is not permitted. Emergency standby power, so that's the maximum power for 200 hours a year with a variable load, and the average power should not exceed 70% of the rating in any 24 hour period. Next, prime power, PRP, maximum power for an unlimited number of hours with a variable load, and the average power should not exceed 70% of the rate of the prime rating in a 24 hour period. However, it also includes a 10% overload capability for one hour in 12 hours. LTP or limited time power, that's the maximum power with a runtime limit of 500 hours but now it allows for 100% constant load. And finally, continuous power or COP. Now that's a maximum power for an unlimited number of hours now. And again, at a constant load, 100%. Please note that COP is not normally used in mains to standby applications. It's also worth noting that some manufacturers do allow some flexibility depending on the application. Two such examples for cola generators are the ESP ratings are allowed to operate for 500 hours rather than the 200 hours and the average power should not exceed 85% rather than the 70% and likewise we allow an average power of 75% for prime power rather than the 70%. So emissions. Well, Emissions really are a balancing act when it comes to particulate matter and NOx. PM forms from the partial combustion of diesel fuel in the cooler parts of the engine. NOx is the result of high cylinder temperatures oxidizing some of the nitrogen in the air. The trade-off, unfortunately, is that they have an inverse relationship when it comes to in-cylinder engine management for performance and emissions. Therefore, Modern engines with high pressure common rail systems and carefully matched turbocharger technology offer the best overall balance. So let's consider some of the site conditions and restrictions. Well, typically in the UK, our ambient is between 35 and 40 degrees, but other parts of the world may be much higher, as much as 55 degrees. Height above sea levels important because that affects the ability of the engine to produce power due to the reduced oxygen levels within the air. Humidity needs to be considered, although this does not normally affect the engine from a power delivery perspective. So what are the restrictions? Well, available space, fuel quality, as not all regions of the world have the same fuel quality, and that can affect the, pa the, engine, the power the engine can produce the reliability and the service intervals. Exhaust and noise emissions are important because generators are often installed close to noise sensitive areas such as residential. The application requirements are the voltage and frequency, the load acceptance and performance, the minimum start time and the rating and duty types that I've just touched on. The load profile uh, is an important point as this can change the rating and duty type that should be applied. The profile can be broken down as follows. The load supplies, so the split between essential and non-essential, as non-essential loads, non loads might not need to be supported by the generator. Is the generator supporting life safety systems? Because this may be need to be connected first. And of course, the total system load. So what are the load types? Well, is there a UPS part of the system? 
What are the heating, ventilation and air conditioning loads? And are there any large motors to start? And are they direct online or are they fitted with soft starts or variable start drives? And is there a lighting and office equipment that needs to be supported? Lastly, the profile periods. Is the load constant? Is there a peak demand? Is there a low or minimum demand? It's an important consideration. Generators are not designed to run for long periods with low load, as this can actually affect the ability of the engine to provide its full power when it's required and can impact on service intervals. Each site or industry will have a typical benchmark for performance of the diesel generator. However, not all industries are the same and the sizing must take that into account. So performance, the start time, the maximum allowable voltage and frequency drop, the minimum load acceptance, how those loads are scheduled. So our advice would be to apply the largest single load step first. Where possible, schedule multiple loads into separate individual load steps. But also keep in mind that you may need to start essential loads first. So a simple example, a 15 second start from initiation of the start signal, G3 compliance with a maximum droop of 7.5% on frequency and minus 15% on voltage and an initial load step of say 30%. Just briefly, let's talk about gross versus net power. An important point because not all manufacturers include them in their advertised power outputs. The difference between the two are the parasitic loads, the main one being the cooling system for the engine. And to a lesser extent, any power used for ancillaries whilst a genset is running. So typically a 2500 kilowatt genset has around 100 kilowatts of parasitic load, which means 2400 kilowatts is available to support the load. Not taking this into account can result in the generator system being undersized. Of course, most manufacturers offer tools that can help guide engineers with the sizing of generator sets. The example above is our tool. The engineer can input the types of loads, the power factor, the emissions and the performance requirements and the tool will suggest the best fit generator for the application. So we've covered many considerations when sizing generators. Here are some other aspects of the design that need to be realized. So the redundancy levels, N plus one, N plus two, or even N plus N. The electrical diversification, i.e. the diversified percentage of the total power required. The load accuracy, and the types of load, for example, is there any harmonic content? Does the generator set need to have any specific fault clearance capability? The location and ambient conditions. Some considerations around distribution. So is an LV generator set, or an MV generator set, the best option? Of course, autonomy, the amount of fuel that needs to be stored. And as I touched on earlier, it's critical that the engine is not oversized. However, this often happens due to applying historic legacy norms. So why is the impact of the changing market and how do we align to those needs when there is reduced space available, noise emissions are becoming more and more restricted, higher output or more generators are required to support greater loads, the need for fast and reliable delivery and the greater dependence on consultants and vendor partners and of course the environmental regulations and the internal sustainability focus. Well, modern engine designs produce gensets with power densities unheard of a few years ago and address these needs. To put this into context, let's look at these two vehicles, both producing 245 horsepower. However, the one on the left, using old technology, has an oversized 5.9 litre engine on the right, a similar vehicle producing the same amount of power, but has a modern, cleaner and more efficient engine without any reduction in the overall performance. Well, this can directly translate into the world of generators. No longer is a 78 litre displacement engine required to produce 2000 kilowatts. 
we can produce the same amount of power from a 62 litre engine, which is a reduction of 20%. So why do these engine improvements matter? Well, they offer a reduced initial cost, a reduced footprint, reduced emissions. They're more efficient, so fuel usage and the size and cost of fuel storage is reduced and reduced maintenance as it's possible to install fewer generators. So how does this acceptance of old norms cause oversizing and stop these benefits from being delivered? Historically, specifiers used an initial load step of 60% as a benchmark to align to the market expectations. So let's look at this example. The engine is started, then a 60% load is applied. The generator recovers within three seconds to do three standard. And then a further 40% is applied and it recovers again. So now it's fully loaded, 100%, and back to steady state voltage and frequency within seven seconds. A modern engine design meeting emissions and all the other benefits that we've already talked about has a 30% load step applied as per the ISO standard. It also recovers within three seconds, then another 30% is applied and finally a 40% load is applied, meaning that the generator is fully loaded to 100% in only three load steps and has recovered to steady state voltage and frequency within 11 seconds. So a difference of only four seconds overall. So to reach the same point as the 60% historic norm, a modern generator with a 30% initial load step could be significantly oversized. In fact, it could be twice as large as in the worst case scenario when taking into account all the application and site requirements. Or we consider the critical power system as a whole. At the heart of any data center's power protection system are of course the generator sets, the UPS, the transfer panels and the switch gear. In this simplified example of an integrated UPS and generator system, we can see the UPS in the center, which can continuously conditions the power and handles any short duration disturbances from a few seconds to a few minutes. We can also see the generator, which handles any long-term power outages, which can be from a few hours to many days. And because the UPS is able to support the load in the short term, the additional four seconds that is required for a modern engine to accept 100% load is easily handled by the UPS. I'm now going to hand over to Alex, who's going to talk more about the UPS architecture and the integration into the power stream. Yeah, th thanks, Ian. Um, yeah, as you were saying, it's very important that we, we look at the whole solution um, with the generators and the load. And in a lot of cases, the UPS is a very large part of the load. So we're just going to have a quick look through um, how we utilize the UPS with the, inside that system and how we you know, make sure that we're using the, the advantages of the modern uh, generators. So when we put in a UPS in, we have to make sure that we consider what the initial load is and future load. And that makes sure we plan and install that upgradable system, understanding the types of load and, and where we're going to be when it's fully loaded. Another thing that we must consider in the whole strategy is the fault clearance of not just the UPS, but obviously of the generator and how the UPS and will handle the downstream faults and how that translates onto the generator systems as well. Importantly, it's very, very important that we understand that the UPS is available. Um, and this is quite often done by integration into the building management systems and monitoring systems on site, because we make, need to make sure that that system is operational. That all comes down to the availability 
and availability is very, very critical and is a, is a big subject. But what we want is the highest availability for the types of load we're running. And we can consider different types of UPSs and we run through those um, to try and make sure we get that availability we want. So we often consider that modular UPS with multiple strings of batteries is going to give you a high availability. But one of the other things that greatly affects that is the redundancy in the systems. So we would often uh, supply an M plus one type system with the redundancy. This obviously also can be incorporated in the generator systems as well. And the, the redundancy and the meantime to repair will greatly increase the availability of that UPS system. But it's all about choosing the right systems for the your load and your application. And that availability um, is, is critical in understanding what you're going to design. One of the things that we do with the UPS is to make sure that we, we're using those advantages of those modern generators, is make sure we can control the walking of the load onto the supply or onto the generator. And with this type of UPS, we will control that gently so we do not exceed the maximum load step of the generator. So we uh, put UPSs as three main types of architecture. So on the left, we have a standalone, sometimes called monolithic type of UPS. This is a single UPS, and this will have just you know, the one component, so have one rectifier, one bypass, one inverter, and it's typically sized for the load you want. Okay, so if you wanted 500 kilowatt load, you'd put 500 kilowatt single UPS in. And then in the middle, we have what we call semi-modular. And this is where some of the components are replicated, such as the inverter and the rectifiers, but some components are shared. You know, it's typically the bypass and the controls. And then we have on the right what we call true modular. And this is where everything is replicated. So all the, the rectifiers, the inverters, the bypasses are replicated, but also all the control and all the displays. Okay, so we have various advantages and disadvantages to those. So with a standalone, initially, you know, these can be uh, initially quite low cost compared with the others. They can be smaller footprint, but they're typically the least resilient. And you have the disadvantage that you typically have to right size from the beginning. So if you, you if you'll know your load's going to be uh, increased in the future, you're going to have to pretty much right size at the beginning. With the semi-modular, you have a medium initial cost. It's partly scalable because some of the components are replicated um, and therefore part load efficiencies can be controlled. You have potential quick mean time to repairs on the replicated components. So they'll typically be a modular type system that we can um, swap in and out on a hotspot basis. But also because there is shared components, some of those might have a longer mean time to repair because they are um, built in and they have to be repaired on site and not swappable, okay? So because of those shared components, you know, we, we do get some uh, resilience problems there. Um, and you might have, you know, some of that has to be right sized from the beginning as well, okay? But with the true modular, uh, we consider this the highest resilience, uh, typically the highest availability, because everything is, is modular and it should be hot swappable, you will have the shortest mean time to repair on the site. Very scalable, you put in what you need and that can be changed around as you change the load either up or down. And because of that and because of the efficiencies, the part load efficiencies are extremely good. So on low load, it's, it's very good. And if you need to take some out, you can take that out um, and make sure you're running it in the most efficient cases. Typically with these true modular UPSs, the footprint is very good. They can be dismantled and put into tighter, smaller spaces. Um, but you know, all that comes at a slightly increased cost over probably the standalone of things like that. Okay. So some of the things we need to consider with the UPS and the whole system is you now how efficient is that UPS? And it's not just about the efficiency at 100%. Most UPSs don't run due to the redundancy at 100%. So it's very important that we understand the efficiency at the load we're planning to run on. We need to understand that the power we gain um, is what we expect. So understanding the output power factor of that system 
um, to make sure we're running the kilowatts we need. And then we look at the supply. This is what affects the, the mains or onto the generator. So we need to make sure that input total harmonic distortion on the input um, on the current is understood and what that power factor will be uh, at the load, which is uh, on the generator or mains. Understanding the overload and short circuit capabilities of the UPS is, is, is uh, very important, especially depending on um, the types of load. So that needs to be a consideration. Are we running it for, for data centers or life safety and things like that? So that, that is a, a very important part. And of course, you know, how big is the machine? Where is it going to fit? And we must always include service access around it. Obviously, UPS batteries need to be serviced, and that must be included when you're, when you're putting these in. Now, UPSs have uh, evolved and they're getting lighter and smaller. However, the batteries typically now are still VRLA and they'll be housed in a rack or cabinet and can be extremely heavy. So that is very important to, to understand from the beginning. Like I said, modern UPSs are becoming much more efficient, uh, but they still need cooling. Um, they typically don't need as much cooling as the batteries. So a UPS will run sort of in an environment of zero to 40 degrees C. However, the battery typically, especially of VRLA, should be managed at, in this country, the UK, we typically manage that at 20 degrees centigrade. And this gives us the best performance and lifespan of that battery. Obviously, in warmer countries, um, the offset is different. So we might, we might sort of go a bit higher on that temperature and replace them earlier. With the battery, you know, we have to understand what type of battery, what the, what the use of that is. Um, like I say, typically they're standby VRLA batteries now. The battery is the backup of the UPS, so we should be managing that ideally, um, uh, or at least monitoring it to make sure that it's available. Um, it's often forgotten and overlooked, but it's a very important part of the UPS system. And then when you are talking to suppliers, what is the supplier service capability, you know, and the number of engineers and how they cover over the area, and are they direct and are they manufactured trained? Uh, there's also no point having the, all the engineer coverage if you haven't got supplies available in the various locations in the area um, to make sure we have sufficient stock of all the parts required um, so we can meet all the SLAs that you, uh, you want, okay? So I'm gonna hand back to Ian. He's gonna go through over the same things uh, with the generator systems with that, so thank you. Thanks for that. So some key aspects to consider on the generator system. What are the sizes and types of loads to be supported now and in the future? Should it be one large generator or multiple smaller ones? What rating is required? Uh, ESP data center continuous or continuous operating power. What load step is actually needed if ISO 8528 only needs to be 30% to comply? Where will the generators be located, e.g. the environment, the space and noise requirements? What autonomy is required? What fuel tank and layout, uh, fuel system layout is pre preferable? What are the other power protection system elements on site? What forms of monitoring and management and reporting are required? And how will service and maintenance be delivered? So some key questions to ask your generator su supplier. Again, what, the rate, what is the rating, the basis rating of their solution? Is it DCP, ESP, COP, et cetera? And what is their net versus gross power? Can they provide a consistent solution regardless of the site location? Can they manage the site installation and commissioning with factory trained engineers? Are they the OEM of the complete package? So engine, genset, and enclosure, and how flexible are the enclosure packaging options? What is the lead time in historical delivery performance? And is the model being offered a native original design or one modified from another region? As this can sap power and affect reliability. What is the supplier's service capability? e.g. number of engineers, coverage, and again, are they direct or subcontracted, and are they manufacturer trained? 
and where and what is the spares capability, the value and the, the location of the stock held in country. So to conclude, significant generator market specific changes are occurring. Sizing still needs to be done carefully, but with an eye towards these changes. New developments mean old norms can result in poor solutions relative to what's possible today. Look at the complete power protection system, not just one component. Review the capabilities of the supplier and the ability to integrate the complete system. So thanks for your attention. We'll now go to any questions that have been asked during the presentation. Thank you very much. Excellent presentations. So much to take in and you'll all be pleased to know there will be a recording of this presentation on the City Journal website. So you're able to go back and review it then. OK, well, um, we've got lots of questions that have come in over the uh, over the webinar so i'm going to pitch straight into these now and our uh, as time allows we will uh, we will pose those to our our speakers uh and the first one is actually from nicole and nicole asks uh you mentioned low noise enclosures what is practically possible and how does that impact on the size of the enclosure Okay, I, I'll pick that one. So, um, well, we can produce really low noise containers, uh, enclosures, uh, you know, as low as 65 dBA at one meter. I mean, it's worth noting, though, I mean, busy city streets are what, 80 dB, and a normal conversation we're having now is around 60. So 65 is very low. But of course, it does come with a footprint uh, size increase, I would say, uh, to, to achieve 65 probably something like 30% larger, something like that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next question here from Paul. And Paul asks, what's the difference between fuel polishing and fuel cleaning? Mm. And as, a, as an additional questionnaire, um, he also asks, how, how long does fuel last in a, in a usable state? Uh, well, fuel polishing, I would say, is something that you install. Uh, you install it on your tank, uh, and it's a it's basically a set of extra filters that are constantly cycling the fuel. Um, and you can most installations you would cycle that fuel for a few hours a day. Uh, so you're passing that fuel through through um, through a, a different set of filters in the bulk in the bulk tank, I should add. Fuel cleaning. I guess that's kind of like the same thing. To me, cleaning would be more, say, if something that's done by an outside contractor that would bring a fuel polishing system onto site, clean the fuel within a bulk tank, and then maybe come back a few weeks or months later to do the same. So I guess that's how I would think about it. Um, in terms of the, uh, the fuel storage, was that the question? Um, yes, it was. Yeah, how, how long will that stay there? I mean, um, easily 12 months. I mean, well, more, longer. For, for a standard number two diesel, just so like an EM590, which is basically the fuel that you get from a pump uh, on your forecourt, I mean, fuel can last for 10 years, no problem at all. Um, one thing that we would always suggest, of course, is that, that when the engine is serviced, well, the generator is serviced, that there's a all the, um, the a sample of that fuel is taken um, and sent to the lab for it to be uh, analysed to make sure that it's still within specification. And that's really just because in case there's contaminants have entered the tank or uh, there's been uh, you know there's water got in the tank in particular. Thank you very much. We've got a couple more questions actually on on the fuel. Um, when considering the environmental issues, uh, do the newer sets use uh, additives such as uh, old old additives that were uh, regularly used? No, I don't think so. No, I mean, 
you know, modern engines are uh, capable. Of, I mean, they're designed to run on standard fuel. Um, no additives, no additives required. Um, as I said, you know, I think modern engines do require low sulfur fuel. Um, I mean, in Europe and in most parts of the world for the last five years, fuels have really the fuel sulfur has, has dropped, and that's been legislated um, so that they can run on modern uh so, they, so modern engines can run on them so i would say no additives required uh but uh, as long as you're buying fuel that's retail you know it's available um from the from the from the local supplier then you'll be absolutely fine and following straight on from that uh, a question from uh, jitten uh with a current push on Biodiesel. Can modern gen sets operate on on such fuels? So biodiesel, yes, they can, but it's the blend of the biodiesel um, and the quantity of the of the blend. So B10 is um, an acceptable blend for Kohler engines. Um, so that's 10% biofuel, 90% standard number number two diesel. Um, Anything more than that, um, we tend to see problems with fuel, really. Um, biodiesel does, uh, well, algae will grow in biodiesel much more easily than it does um, in standard diesel. And I think if I've got, if I'm reading the question right, the storage uh, of biodiesel is significantly shorter. And I think you've said there, Jitten, that uh, six months. I would say six months is about the maximum. And I think it's worth bearing in mind that, you know, in a data center that's got many megawatts of engines uh, installed and a, a vast amount of fuel being stored on site, um, and these units are in standby mode, right? So they're not burning their fuel. Um, that would be a, a, an, an, a lot of fuel to, uh, to have to replace every, uh, every six months. You know, a typical two megawatt gen set could have 30,000 litres of fuel uh, in store for it in, on that data center. So a lot of fuel to, to manage um, and biodiesel really doesn't suit that sort of application. That sounds like a major consideration. Yeah, th thanks for that. Yeah. Uh, okay, got a question here from Michael. Uh, Michael asks, uh, uh, about the impact of, of faults, we jump now to the UPS, and and does that does that uh, increase the initial load step on on a generator? Okay, I'll, I'll take that um, that question. Yeah, well, you have to consider um, where the fault is in the system. Um, if the fault is downstream of the UPS, um, the UPS will try and handle that fault, and if it can handle it on the overload capability, then it will remain online and deal with that fault. If the fault is too great uh, for the UPS to handle, that will transfer the load onto the bypass line. And now that bypass line can be being fed by the mains or it could be fed, uh, being fed by the generator. Now, of course, if it is on generator, then what we're doing is we're actually transferring the base load and the faults onto the generator. So that's that's part of that overall the system design when we're looking at the the old the whole integrated power. So the the generator or all the mains and people must design it to work on both uh, must be able to handle uh, you know the discrimination of the faults clearing um, for that. I mean, another part of that question could be if the UPS has a fault, um, then what happens in that case? Now, if you had a, just a standalone single UPS, that UPS, if that develops a fault internally or is it off for maintenance, it will be on static bypass. And therefore, the load again will be directly uh, fed from either the mains or the generator. Now, we don't want that situation because if you have a mains failure at that time, the uh, the output of the UPS will be lost in the time it takes for the generator to start. And that would give a big 
uh, load step onto the generator as it tried to restart all the load. So this is why typically we have uh, redundancy built into the UPS systems. So I ran plus one, M plus two or M plus N. So if there was a problem there with part of the UPS, then we have the redundancy built in so the UPS remains online supporting the load. So we are still managing the load step onto the generator um, if that's required. So I hope that answers uh, both parts of that question. Yeah, thanks, Alex. I think I think you covered that uh, reasonably comprehensively. Uh, let's move on now to a question from from Nigel. And uh, Nigel asks, when selecting a generator, how do you allow for future spare capacity, given a need to avoid oversizing? Yeah, OK. Uh, I would say for that one, really, it's about um, installing only the generators that you need uh, at the time. Um, you know, we talked about redundancy, um, you know, so you've got your N, your need at that time. Um, and then you add to the N, uh, maybe maintaining the one as the uh, as the site load grows. So typically a data center, you know, let's just say typically a 20 megawatt data center, you may only install five megawatts from day one. Um, so maybe two uh, or three units and then just add to that. But I guess it's really important, important to consider uh, how you integrate those future generator sets. And of course, uh, ensure that you've got a control system um, where you can uh, that can accept those additional generator sets simply um, and without taking the existing sets offline. Uh, I hope that sort of answers the question. Yeah, I, 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 thank you very much uh, for that. Ian. We got a follow-up question really from John. Uh, how often should a generator be? test run on an offline is off is offline testing bad for the engine he asks yeah that's a question I, we get asked a lot actually um and i think our advice is um by all means start a generator um most people will start their generators once a month um but if they're not loaded um i.e you can't put them onto site load uh, or you can't load bank them, then run them um, for as short amount of time as possible. Um, we would suggest then um, every six months um, that the generator is, is put on load, um, load banked. Uh, I, I would say a, ma a minimum of 30 to 50%, something like that, 30 to 50% load uh, once every six months. Um, just to ensure that, uh, like I say, this, um, the engine is capable of providing its full power when, when it really needs to. Um, I think, yeah, is that okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next question uh, from, from Patrick. Uh, do, do you recommend using inductive load to test a generator, uh, which is installed for a, oh, I think that's he uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning load, uh, is it critical to test a gen set with a UPS online and in bypass mode? Um, well, I think if I understand correctly, so any load is, as long as the generator set sees kilowatts, then, you know, it's, it's absolutely fine. Um, the, you know, really you are test, because of course you are testing the mechanical and the electrical capability of the unit. But as long as that unit seeing uh, seeing kilowatts, uh, Alex, I'll let you answer the uh, the next one. Is the critical test uh, with the UPS online or in bypass mode? What's your view? Yeah, I mean the UPS should have a self test function in it, um, so it can test it. What we're very uh, what we need to know is does the battery work, and you know a good UPS will have the a, the ability to test the batteries on load in a safe way. So, yeah, it's, of course, at maintenance is very important that we, we fully test that battery. But for a user, running a regular battery uh, test is, is a good thing to do. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next question from, from Richard. Uh, he, he notes that uh, 
Ian, you, you mentioned that there's a program that Kohler uses for genset selection. Um, is this available to purchase or is it available through uh, a website somewhere? Yeah, well, it's, it's certainly available and um, no purchase required. So if um, if Richard is, you know, specifying and, and wants to um, work, do some genset selection, then by all means, um, there's a link in that presentation. Um, there's like all like all systems, you know, it takes a little bit of it'll take a little bit of navigating. But um, the way our the way our uh, um, genset sizing program works actually, you can uh, you can draw a single line diagram. So you can put your you can put your generator, you can put your UPS, uh, you can put all your different loads, uh, and then you can you know hit the um, um, sort of the run button as it were, and it will it will uh, advise you of the best available generator set to suit that load and that that single line diagram that you've uh, that you've put together. Of course, I would always say contact your manufacturer um, just to make sure that you've got the absolute latest information. But uh, I guess that's the beauty of the online tools, you know. Um, but yeah, go online, uh, register, um, and uh, have a go with the tool. Great, thanks, for that, Ian. And, and just a reminder, the, uh, the the whole presentation, recording presentation, will be available through the SIPSI website. And and Cola have, have confirmed that they will make a PDF of a presentation available as well. So you've got to go back and review these and look at those links as mentioned by by Ian. So thanks, for that, Ian. Um, next question from from David, and uh, he just asks, uh, does it, does the uh, KVA output assume an upper outside air temperature? Uh, yes, yes it does. So an alternator is normally sized at 40 degree ambient. Having said that, of course, uh, an alternator can be oversized to account for that. Uh, an engine, um, uh, the ambient temperature does affect the engine. Um, again, you can account for that with cooling. Um, so does it affect it? Yes but it can be it can be engineered um so as i say 55 degrees is a you know that's a tropical environment that's a really hot environment so um you know it's all about making sure that the radiator is capable it's all about making sure that the alternator is correctly sized and you know where the engine is installed has got an allows an adequate amount of airflow whether that's in a room or in an enclosure to uh, to make sure that that the, you know the, the restriction on the fan or the cooling system inside that enclosure or, or, or room uh, is is working correctly, I guess. So yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question here from Steve. Um, looking back at fuels again, and he says, uh, with the future of, uh, of fuels, uh, how do you see the future for package and installed gensets. Are there any innovations for primary engines or are there alternative solutions? Um, yeah, okay, so future fuels. I mean, we talked about biofuel. Um, there's lots of other different fuels available. Um, so there's HVO fuels, which are which is a renewable fuel. Um, there's um, there's carbon capture fuel, believe it or not. So um, they're actually making fuel, renewable fuel, from carbon capture in the air, uh, which is really interesting. Um, so that's a potential future development. Um, of course, manufacturers are looking at use uh, running engines on um, hydrogen. So um, I think that's a way to go. I think that'll be really interesting. Um, but actually running a reciprocating engine on hydrogen fuel. Um, so I guess that's the um, I, that's the future of the reciprocating engine. I guess where it sits currently, um, you know, an, a diesel or a reciprocating engine that's that's running on on the, on diesel is um, how can I put it? It's a whilst the engine is in standby mode, particularly. Uh, you know, they're not. It's not burning fuel. Um, it's actually a really efficient solution. 
to get many mega many megawatts of power um, available in an outage within you know 10 to 15 seconds so um, I don't think uh, I'll maybe maybe Alex will talk about batteries but I think to scale batteries up to, to, to the sort of megawatts we're talking about for data center uh, would be one well, extremely costly uh, both from a purchasing perspective but also from an operational perspective and from a space perspective so I think at the moment as it's you know for the foreseeable future um, the reciprocating engine is the best solution I hope that has to watch I guess. yeah absolutely yeah uh, Alex I don't know if you want to say anything like that but we've got a load more questions I can pitch pitch through the next question if that's okay no, with yeah I mean with, with regards to batteries on the on UPS and supplies obviously we do see the the increase of batteries being used as a temporary for frequency response however you know for for long term uh, outages you know the, the generator for the foreseeable is going to be the way to go um because obviously a generator can be refueled um with a fuel tank whereas a battery can't so yeah for the foreseeable it's going to be uh it's going to be a generator backup for sure Alex, I can jump in here then with a, a question from from Nicholas. He 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 says, what is a typical life expectancy of, of UPS batteries, and and how often should they be changed? Okay, yeah. The, to start with, it depends on the type of battery. Typically, batteries are bought as a, a five year design life, ten year, twelve or fifteen, depends what you what you specify. Now that's a design life. So if we use a typical battery for data center is a, is a 10 year design life. Now, if you keep that at 20 degrees, which is critical, um, you typically get about seven to eight years of reliable battery um, life from that. So we're looking to replace a 10 year battery around about the seven to eight year mark. If it's a five year battery around about the three and a half to four year mark. Um, that is providing you're running at 20 degrees. Like, you know, this one of the big problems we get is is people say, well, we've got a design life battery of 10 years. We've put it in 30 degrees and it needs changing after four. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's very critical that we we understand that if you run a battery at high temperature, you will be replacing it early. Um, but, and you will also be replacing it for the reliability and insurance. You'll be replacing it you know, before the design life is up. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left, so let's just pick up uh, hopefully one or two more questions very swiftly. Um, uh, Ian, you, you spoke of the ISO 85285 um, criteria, performance criteria. Is it, I got a question from um, Margosha here, and she, she asked, is G2 a suitable performance specification for data centers? Okay, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, given everything that we talked about, particularly with the UPS, you know, um, it will it will um, not only will it, it will handle a G3 or a G2 compliant engine because it's it is conditioning the power, of course, you know. So, and of course, if it's a G2, um, then there's more benefits to be had because again, you know, you could be topping down an engine size or an alternator size. So, absolutely, yes, G2. Really, just consider those two things very carefully. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thanks a lot. I, I think we've got time for one more question now. Um, this one's from Adele, and Adele asks, um, does the size and type of UPS affect the generator selection? Would a single phase UPS supporting a single 20 amp load need to be considered? Thanks. Alex, do you want to take that one? Yeah, okay. The, uh, how does the UPS uh, affect the generator selection? Well, when we're looking at UPS, you know, it, on the generator, we have to consider that walking. So if we was, you can't just size possibly one UPS the same size as a generator because we want to manage that walking to the, whatever that modern engine can do. So what we might have to do is split that UPS into to separate um, systems 
so we can have you know the walk-in done over several modules over more time uh, to make sure that 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 is integrated in that system so you know that that it all depends on the whole integration of the system um so yes it does affect it um so yeah please come and talk to us and we can make sure we work out what's required thanks very much alex we we're drawn to a close there i'll swiftly say though before before you switch off and leave today's webinar please just hang on for just a few more seconds after we finish to complete a, a very short feedback sheet we'd be really pleased to get that um we will be sending out confirmation of your participation in in today's webinar you'll get an email with that and there will be a recording of webinar with all the audio and the slides which i think you need there's so much information here and so much information is q a you really need to go back and review this so please go on to the Sibsi journal website in a few days time and that will be available to you so i just like to conclude by by thanking uh Ian and Alex for such a fantastic performance today. You've covered an enormous range of material and you've given some wonderful uh, uh, answers to the question. So thank you for your time today. Thank you for all that information you've shared with you, with us. And of course, thank everybody for joining in as, as audience today. We've had hundreds of people across the world join in today and we really look forward to joining you again for a, a Sibsi Journal webinar in just a few weeks time. So thank you for being with us and don't forget to hang on and fill in that survey. Good afternoon.